वेलकम टू डेली डी ब्रीफ ब्रॉड टू यू बाई पीपल्स डिस्पैच आई एम श्रिया एंड टूडे वी ब्रिंग द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स वेर रेल वर्कर्स आर अबाउट टू गो ऑन स्ट्राइक एंड द गवर्नमेंट इज ट्राइंग टू स्टॉप दैम वी ऑल्सो टॉक अबाउट अ रिपोर्ट ऑन द इन इक्वालिटीज इन द ग्लोबल रिस्पॉन्स टू एड्स एंड फाइनली इलेक्शन आर ऑन इन अ मेजर इंडियन स्टेट एंड वी ब्रिंग यू सम ऑफ द की इशूज रेल वर्कर्स इन द यू एस आर एंग्री एट अ ब्रूटल वर्क शेड्यूल्स एंड द लैक ऑफ पेड हॉलीडेज दे हैव बीन प्रोटेस्टिंग एंड मोबिलाइजिंग फॉर मंथ्स In September the Joe Biden administration intervened to formulate a deal but some of the big unions of workers voted to reject the deal. Now the US Congress has intervened to pass a bill that might block a strike by them. Anish from People's Dispatch is with us to discuss the latest on this issue. Hi Anish. So what is the latest that we have and what is this deal that is being imposed? So uh, this deal is essentially the tentative deal that was arrived at on based on the recommendations of the uh, the mediation uh, committee that uh, Biden administration had uh, you know constituted when they were trying to mediate between uh, the trade unions and the uh, the rail operators the railroad operators uh, so in that uh, several unions at least four of the 12 uh unions representing about 100000 workers railroad workers rejected the deal uh by a clear majority in all four cases and uh, the deal was only accepted by quite begrudgingly in most of the other cases where you actually see not like an overwhelming support coming uh from uh, members of the other trade unions either so it is like a large, a large number uh, a large plurality of uh, the trade union members do not accept the bill and there is also even when you look at like the majorities it wasn't like a very uh, you know a very uh, outright uh, or very you know enthusiastic uh, majority in favor of the bill now even when the four even if you just consider these four trade unions in this case the fact is that uh, it is essential that these four trade unions be taken into the entire process itself undermining their uh, right to decide what the trade uh, what the deal has would look like uh, is undermining the entire process itself because each of these trade unions represent uh, sectors and units that are essential for the operation of uh, railroads across the united states and so if you're undermining even one of them and that is pretty much how it works like even if one, even one of them actually rejects the deal then the whole uh, rail union goes into strike so this is something that the democrats have tried to avoid uh, they got republican support as well as we've seen even though if not the majority of the republicans but a good number to give them a clear majority in the house and uh, the deal kind of uh, gives them a 25% rise which a uh, is big uh, cons- uh, cons- in the past four decades actually the biggest uh, raise that uh, trade uh, rail workers have been given but the thing is that we need to talk about the fact that for the past four decades there has been clear stagnation and in the last decade or so there has been real uh, real term decline in wages uh, even if not in absolute terms there has been in, in real terms a decline in wages were not considered when this wage hike was suggested by the Biden administration uh, and that itself is far far below what uh, trade unions are demanding for their workers which is for them is a fair fair and just uh, wage hike that is necessary for them to have uh, not only have a decent living wage but also to uh, compensate for the sacrifices that they have made during the work shortage uh, labor shortages and during the covid-19 pandemic thank you so much anish for joining us today every year on december 1 the world commemorates world aids day in its 2022 dangerous inequalities report un aids highlights how inequalities of gender age and treatment accessibility are key drivers of the pandemic where these three intersect the consequences are amplified even further we joined by anna from people's health movement who has the latest on this issue Hello Anna welcome to the show so can you take us through some of the key findings of this report well simply put the new un aids report shows that the global aids response is completely off track well maybe not completely but seriously off track for sure so first thing uh, we have seen that the decline in aids related deaths and uh, the number of new hiv infections is slowing down 
So uh, this means that also many regions are also seeing an increase in new infections. So uh, what the report does is focus, it, it focuses uh, on inequities that are impacting the, the global AIDS response. So this includes uh, um, disparities when we talk about access to care or uh, how the indicators are going. Uh, it looks at differences uh, between uh, women and men. It looks at the differences that uh, some key populations such as uh, LGBTI communities experience or sex workers and so on. So one of the uh, one of the most uh, most interesting uh, elements of the report, I would say, is the gender dimension of it, uh, and uh, the data that it shows here are particularly striking uh, because UNH here states that uh, gender uh, gen gender inequalities uh, are actually a key driver of the AIDS pandemic today. So um, you know, if we talk about numbers. Uh, in, in, in the period that the, the report looks at, we have seen that in many parts of Africa, uh, young women are three times more likely to get HIV compared to men of the same age. Uh, but of course, this is not only about AIDS disparities, so it's not AIDS-specific. Uh, women's health and the likelihood of them contracting uh, HIV is impacted by the overall health context in, uh, in which, which they are forced to navigate. So it has a lot to do with uh, gender inequalities. It has a lot to do with power dynamics. Uh, essentially, it's uh, it's it's more complex than than only looking at a single disease. So, for example, if we look uh, at um, at gender-based uh, violence and intimate partner violence uh, last year. Um, the report states that uh, women who have been exposed, who have experienced intimate partner violence, uh, were more than three times uh, more likely to contract uh, HIV than, than those who were not. Um, and then, of course, you know, it's, it's important to say that, um, and the report shows this, uh, that if we look at how uh, this can be uh, this can be alleviated. Uh, it's uh, it's again not only uh, health system specific. Uh, it has a lot to do with changing uh, the gender norms that uh, that we live with. Uh, and the report says that you know by uh, by making sure that we change the gender norms that are predominant among uh, men and boys. Uh, we are not only uh, doing it for their benefit, so we're not only reducing uh, the risk of them acquiring HIV, but we are also indirectly uh, acting towards decreasing the likelihood of women and girls contracting HIV, uh, which only shows the importance of having having a more complex a complex approach to this question. But then again, of course, women are not the only group who are mentioned in the report. Uh, I've said that uh, you know key populations which uh, historically have been uh, have been exposed to HIV risks uh, uh, more, uh, they have experienced serious issues uh, and they are often not prioritized as they should be in in national policies. Uh, we have also seen worrying trends among children because um, we are seeing for for one thing uh, a widening and deepening. A disparity in access to care between adults and children. So, for example, according to the report, around 60% of children between 5 and 14 years of age uh, are living with HIV, not receiving treatment. So that's, you know, it, it's an enormous number if you think about it. Hmm. Uh, and then, of course, there are also problems with the diagnosis because children are being diagnosed late and that, of course, impacts uh, the possibility of a reaction and of making sure that they have access to, to the care and to the, uh, to the medicines that they need. And Anna, uh, there are some regional inequalities also, like the report notes how there's been hardly any decline in infections when it comes to areas like Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Myanmar, Vietnam. So what can be said about that? And another question would be that uh, what has taken the world so long to tackle the HIV infection? Well, I think the two can also be considered together uh, because uh, we have mentioned before that, you know, uh, it's um, it, the, the global AIDS response uh, has also a lot to do. It's very connected to what's happening on the local 
uh, on the local level. And that brings us to the finances because we are seeing on the local level that health systems are definitely not being prioritized, although the COVID-19 pandemic was hailed as some kind of big lesson for, uh, for policymakers. So we are not seeing the money going towards health systems uh, and actually guaranteeing more uh, like stronger and bigger budgets for for national health policies would ensure that people living with uh, with AIDS and HIV uh, would have access to to the care they need. Uh, this is also true for the global level because we are seeing that you know uh, although um, the the global AIDS response uh, has been recognized by the UN, it has been recognized by a number of international institutions. Uh, it is not seeing. Uh, the adequate amount of commitment uh, when it comes to finances. Uh, and I think it should be said that this is not, not specific to AIDS, again. Uh, it's something that we have seen uh, in, in the case on, of many other diseases. Uh, tuberculosis, for one thing, uh, the recent tuberculosis report uh, also indicates that, you know, a lack of funding uh, has actually put us, has widened the gap between where we are now and where uh, where we wanted to, to see <laughs> to see ourselves uh, in, in 2020, 2025, in, in five years, whenever. So uh, I think it's important to highlight that, that um, it's... Um, it's very important when we discuss global uh, global preparedness and response to uh, to infectious diseases that we have to stand behind it financially also. And this means uh, that high income countries again be bear a much bigger responsibility. They should be bearing a, a much bigger responsibility and should be standing behind these programs, because of course uh, in low and middle income countries we have less room of uh, of actually guaranteeing the amount uh, the amount of uh, the amount of money that health systems needs uh, and this is because uh, because of the other pressures that they are exposed to thank you so much anna for that update india's prime minister narendra modi has been touring his home state gujarat where assembly elections are ongoing the hotly contested election holds significance for india the results will prove vital for another round of elections in big states next year and the 2024 national elections. Before becoming the Prime Minister, Modi was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. He and his party have projected Gujarat as a model for the country. However, state critics have stated that includes divisive politics based on religion and hypernationalism. The hill state Himachal Pradesh has already voted. But the problems here are similar. A lopsided tax structure, poor employment status and many other issues and concerns. We are joined by Pragya from News Click for more discussion on this issue. Welcome to the show Pragya. Crucial elections. What is the picture looking like in Gujarat and Himachal? Uh, yes, Shreya, there are crucial elections both for different reasons, Gujarat and Himachal Pradesh. Uh, you know, in 2002, the BJP won its biggest victory margin ever in, uh, in Gujarat. That was a few months after a massive uh, you know, communal program uh, uh, in which the victims are mostly the Muslims. And that sort of set the tableau for what kind of politics Gujarat would have henceforth. Um, now, uh, in Himachal Pradesh, the issues, of course, are slightly different. Uh, Gujarat has 182 seats uh, on which people have to elect a representative. Himachal Pradesh has 68. It's a much smaller state. It's a hilly state. And it's also a state where unemployment is emerging as the biggest issue and as well as the corporate control over farming, uh, in particular the orchards where, uh, you know, the BJP and the Congress have again been vying for power, um, you know, and there is a tendency to ha have one party replace the other in, uh, in Himachal. So, but Gujarat, by contrast, is a place where the BJP has installed itself as you could say the de facto power uh, center in the state where it, the, you know, the election even now uh, is all about whether the BJP can be unseated in Gujarat. So that's basically uh, the, the basic framework of the election in Gujarat, which is also important because it's sort of like a showpiece state for the economic model that the Bharti Janata Party, the BJP, has been projecting for the center as well. They say that the Gujarat model is a successful model for the economy and for the people and now we are finding that you know the Gujarat model is actually not that successful on many of the human development indices so the question is that will the will the people of Gujarat 
who have realized in many parts, as the ground reporting shows, that the model is not what it was set out to be, what will, how will it influence their voting is what we're going to see. And Pragya, can you also highlight some of the issues in these states that will be at the forefront of the elections? So in Gujarat, the primary issue is once again likely to be along different planes. So for the first time, we are seeing that there is a multi-cornered contest, which means a triangular contest, which is known in Indian electoral parlance, which is that three parties are contesting. This is not a very common feature in Gujarat. It is a state which is, you know, uh, typically ruled by two parties, where there's mm -hmm. one principal opposition party and there's a ruling party, which has tended to be the BJP in recent, uh, recent past. So now we have a new entrant, the Aam Admi Party, which, according to some ground reports, is making its presence felt. This raises three important issues for three different parties, for the Bharati Janta Party, for the BJP, if it does not perform well in this election, which means that the 2002 performance will become the yardstick for it to do well, where in the first past the post system, if the margins, uh, smaller margins will ensure a larger number of victories for a, a ruling party, right, which is also uh, trying to prove its popularity. For the Congress party, now the Congress party has been engaged in this very big march across the country which they're doing to spread a message of love and brotherhood as opposed to hatred, which according to the Congress party is a way to fight the political message of the BJP, which is Hindutva, which is uh, hard right nationalism based on religious politics. So if the BJP does not do very well in this context, then it would be disappointed. If the Congress party, on the other hand, does not emerge as a second, as a lead opposition party, as a second runner up in this election, then there would be concerns not just for the party itself, but also for national politics, because the Congress is the largest opposition on a national scale, and it is supposed to be the party which leads all other parties into an alliance before or after the election in 2024 on the national scale. So if it emerges as, say, the third party, then that would be a very big disappointment for the Congress and a big question mark for a future alliance which beats the BJP. We have to remember that this time the people of Gujarat are not voting on the typical, not, you know, we don't know about voting, the election can always spring a surprise, but they're not talking about just the usual issues that get talked about in Gujarat. You know, Gujarat is a border state very close to Pakistan, and so it's been relatively uh, possible to whip up sentiments along religious lines over there, but this time people are raising issues such as uh, the lack of development and progress in Gujarat, the fact that the wages of the workers in Gujarat are lower, very often lower than the national average, and that the poorer states are performing better than Gujarat on even development indicators. For example, since 2005, the numbers show us that the number of children who go to school is actually not improving in Gujarat, they're faring mm. worse. 40% of the children are malnourished in a state where, um, you know, which is actually topping the charts in terms of state income. So these are the questions which are informing the election this time. It is not about Hindu versus Muslims, which is the kind of politics that the BJP tries to whip up. Some are saying that the Congress party is being strategically silent in this election so that the BJP cannot uh, level these, hurl these charges at it. But uh, it's only when the election results are out that we'll find out. Thank you, Pragya. Thank you so much for joining us. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories and updates from around the world, keep watching peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.